It's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm very glad that a conference like this is being organized and hosted and held because as previous speakers have been saying, the critical voices have been very silent and silenced over the past decades. And to offer a forum for critical debate is in these days and ages where critical voices tend to be silenced, not only in sciences, the more important, ever more important and growing in, in its importance. So I've been working, thinking, studying, researching Bacillus thuringiensis proteins from various sources since 1990. So I've covering, I'm covering now more than a quarter of a century of research and debate uh, around the proteins of this uh, fabulous uh, bacteria. Um, when I started out in 1990 in the United States within a PMI PhD, we dealt with BT sprays and pesticides. This is an image of uh, such a, a bacterial cell where you see the spores and the crystalline inclusion bodies. That's where the cry denomination or the cry names for the toxins come from. They are deposited in a crystalline form. These are insecticidal proteins so that they can withstand and uh, remain in the soil unaltered until an insect comes by and picks it up and, and eats it and ingests it. Um, microbial pesticides built on this bacillus uh, from fermentation processes are being used in agriculture since at least half a century. Um, they are very popular or used to be uh, popular um, pesticides also in organic production and these are some of the labels you can find in any given uh, garden utility store here in Switzerland or anywhere in the world. Um, this is a Swiss product. These are products in the English-speaking world. They are, as I said, um, products of fermentation. They contain the spores and the crystals that are inactive in combination. We know that spores and crystals synergistically interact. However, there was always uh, two limitations that limited its application in agriculture, in particular in industrial agriculture. It's that these products, once you brought them out, um, degrade fairly rapidly, they're instable uh, under UV light, they're easily washed off by rain. And the second, and just as important constraint, is that they work primarily and best against the small juvenile instars. So a farmer has a very limited window of opportunity to go out there and actually um, hit the target. Uh, it doesn't, it must not rain on that day when the Colorado potato beetle larvae or the caterpillar larvae are in the suitable life stage so that you can go in with your tractor and spray it. So although if, it, if you hit that window of opportunity, it works really nicely, but this uh, has proven to be serious limitation in particular in industrial agriculture. So as genetic engineering tools came along, genetic engineers realized uh, or tried to overcome this kind of uh, limitation by putting the DNA that codes for the expression of the activated toxin, and I'll get to that in a moment, what's the difference, um, into, through the regular genetic engineering processes, into a number of crop plants. The most important ones currently grown on the planet is Bt cotton and Bt maize, as you see here. And the idea was that now that the maize plant can express those toxins itself, any of the pests that feed on it and are susceptible to it will pick it up at any given time during the entire season and get a serious belly ache and die of it eventually. So in 1996, the first such plants were released in commercial agriculture and from there um, the on it went and was taken up in industrial agriculture quite significantly. In 2003, a number of scientists working in this field, uh, in particular in industrial agriculture, named it a cornerstone of modern agriculture, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, meaning with modern agriculture, of course, the industrial form of agriculture in the United States. Now, I'd like to question this, uh, and right from the beginning, as I was right there when it happened in the United States, we started to ask ourselves, what could the consequences be if you built in the production and synthesis of a highly potent bioactive compound in a plant 24-7? Because that's what we had now. We had ideally and wantedly a high dose of expression of the activated Bt toxin, not the spores and the crystals, in all plant parts from day one to harvest. Right? That's what you wanted. So in those 
days, my work as a PhD was in those days to look into IPM and how BT sprays could work together with other measures you could take in agriculture. Well, those days were gone very quickly when this came out. IPM and thresholds and scouting and monitoring for these pests that were targeted with the BT plants were gone and over. They were thought to be taken care of by the toxin. Of course, such an expression, season long, in all plant parts at high doses, including pollen, for example, which was the first time that we could make maize pollen insecticidal, um, vastly expands the spatiotemporal exposure in the agroecosystem, which vastly expands the types of the organisms that get exposed to it and will routinely and continuously pick it up and ingest those activated toxins. In particular, if you are growing Bt cotton after Bt maize, and these days also Bt soybean, and these are oftentimes where I studied at the East Coast, uh, the classical kinds of crops that were growing either in subsequently or next to each other in the same region. So there was a persistent, continuous exposure to Bt, meaning a lot of non-target effects are much more likely now, and some of the scientists like myself who have been working in insect ecology and agroecology were asking clearly the question, so where is the knowledge that we think we have is actually coming from in those days? And what do we know about the range of affected organisms to this day and that day in, in, in the 90s, early 90s? And what scientific databases is this built on? Well, you were even then, um, Surprised I was, I was working with BT uh, sprays in, in the 1990s, early 90s myself, and I knew the literature about the toxin and where our knowledge came from pretty well at that time, and continued to look for it, and found on the other side a lot of sweeping claims that you still find in the dossier submitted for regulatory approval of these crops that are all based on the extension and the extrapolation of what we used to know until the 90s and it extends to today, from these BT formulations that were biochemically and functionally very different to what was actually expressed in the plant. These are random sentences you can pick out. I just downloaded this a couple days ago in preparation for this, for this meeting. This is still what you find a standard argument in any BT crop plant dossier you submit to the regulatory authorities. This is just downloaded from the Biosafety Clearinghouse website of the Cartagena Protocol. Out of those two orders, or one order, it was ever tested and looked on, it was further reduced to those insects of these orders that are herbivores, meaning they feed on plants. There's a lot of other types of organisms in there that are not only herbivores, but herbivores of our crops, which is an even smaller subgroup of organisms, and who are pests, who made it on our radar that we want to control them. So in essence, it is a few dozen of organisms that we know our understanding of BT from. And from this, it's vastly extrapolated to all organisms, and therefore we don't have to look into the safety of it. What the, is the node, mode of action? Well, in 1990, when I started to work, the world was pretty simple. This was basically the classic pore formation model. You had the crystals, again, we're talking pesticides. You had crystals and spores are not depicted here. Those crystals had to be dissolved at a very high pH, 10, 11, and 12, in the insect gut, had to be taken up. It would release a still inactive protoxin that then had to be degraded by a certain cocktail of gut enzymes to a smaller fragment, a degraded fragment that is toxic, or we consider the toxin, that binds to a receptor, and this receptor-bound um, protein will then induce in a complex form pore formation. It actually punches the gut, and then the bacteria from the gut enter the hemocele and cause serious infection, and that's what the insect dies of. Now, since a number of years now, we have an additional model called the so-called uh, sequential binding model, where you have an additional um, receptor proposed saying that changes the three dimensional configuration and oligomerizes the protein before it then binds to the receptors we thought we know until that time. 
Then a third one came along called the signal transduction model, which still builds on one receptor, but then doesn't seem to be finding pore formation an essential role anymore. So the insect dies of a, of a process, a cellular process that's called cell death, and pores are not necessarily have to be formed anymore. Then there were other groups. It's always groups who work on these models. And there's another group um, that suggests it's actually both types. You have the sequential binding model and the signal transduction model that causes the death. And then you have another group who says pretty much this is all rubbish. If we really look into the data supporting either of these models, we find that they are rather thin and that many of the really important questions are as poorly understood published in 2012 as they were before these models were proposed, and they concur and say that ultimately for them, the classical simple model proposed in the 80s and 90s, the model that I worked out uh, to, to work with, still in their mind is the most valid framework and uh, explaining how BT works. Now in plants, we don't have, as I said, we don't have crystals and we don't have protoxids. We have degraded fragments of these proteins expressed in these plants, meaning that for the mode of action in any other organism that picks it up, these two critical steps that define which insect would die and which would not die, so was part of the specificity uh, narrative that was, was put out, doesn't exist anymore, it doesn't have a, have a role in it. It is simply the toxin and what follows from that, and these receptors are by no means rare. They are common in insects, they have different forms, but they do occur, and they occur in more than just the dozens of insects we looked into for uh, pest control purposes. And what we find in transgenic plants as well is a number of further degraded fragments of, this, uh, of the Bt compound, where we don't know whether that's due to incomplete translation and genetic processes, or whether that is in-plant processing, continued processing of that protein, Anyway, we do have basically in all plants, this is just an example of cowpea, we have different bands of fragmented pieces and sizes of the molecule of which we don't know if it is still active and if it is active against who and what. To make matters even more complicated, some scientists have been proposing 10 years ago that the Bt by itself doesn't even kill. It is actually other things that kill than the organism, like the bacteria that get into the hemolymph. They published a paper where they treated their highly susceptible insects first with antibiotics and cleaned out all the my gut microbes and then added Bt in their diet and they didn't die anymore. Others repeated this method, cleaned the guts with antibiotics and found their mosquitoes die even more of it. And yet others have now started to look into what this all means actually to Bt plants because they all work with the uh, microbials and are finding a bit of what the first group has been finding, that if you clean the gut microbiota out, the Bt toxin is reduced in its mortality. Very little so far looked into this further. So my conclusion from this is the mode of action was always poorly understood. We seem to know less about how Bt works today than we seem to know when I started out in 1990, when the world was much more simple with one model. But we deliberately choose, still today, to look into the mode of action, all of the research that is done, still in that handful of insects that we consider herbivorous pests on some of our crop plants. We refuse to look into what it could do to all the other organisms that are out there and are affected. And we do this in the most narrow terms. We look for insects and we look for effects that are what I call quick kills because we look through it in entirely through the lens of a pest control person. We want those insects that eat our pests, our, our plants to be dead quickly. So it's short term and acute effects that we focus on from a pest control perspective. As environmental scientists and agroecologists and those people who are to deal and do risk assessments for environmental impacts, that is of course not good enough. We're not pest controllers. We look into the effects that happen once pest control is being taken care of. We start our work where pest controllers and plant protection experts end. And we look into anything. We, for us, is also long-term and chronic effects really important. Because a low level of mortality can sometimes be put away by a, by a population fairly quickly. But if you disrupt through developmental processes and growth processes, if you disrupt, disrupt really important synchronies in nature, 
the consequences for the population can be at least as severe, if not more severe than mortality can. So some of us, uh, the more daring and more brave of us, started to look into these other types of effects in other types of organisms that could possibly happen. And I told, based on what some of the previous speakers said, you had to be brave to do it because you were guaranteed to become the, the, uh, the adjective to, uh, given to you that you're anti-science when you ask these kinds of scientific questions. So some of us looked into, and this is by no means a complete list and not for you to really go through it point by point, what I'd like to illustrate to you is the range of organisms that have been shown and published about that have show effects and the range of kinds of effects outside of survival, outside of being lethally affected on abundance, on enzyme activity, on weight, on growth and development and behavior this can induce. And I will of course declare that some of us come from my group, but not all of us, also others have been looking and finding things in crayfish and in snails. Now, the colleague of mine I was referring to earlier has looked into this and called them these non-target effects, cross-order and cross-film effects, and he found that for 20, in these 148 reported studies, 27 proteins he found were affecting a total of 69 taxa. Most of them, or many of them, in the low tox range, some in the medium tox range, and two at least of them in the high tox range. So a lot was possible out there, and my conclusion, you can conclude what you want, but my conclusion from this was Bt toxins are not that specific as they were proclaimed, and if they are specific, they are under the most narrow framework specific, only if you focus your view and define an effect that is acute and immediately lethal, for, which is a pest control perspective. Our perspective as environmental scientists, we must not take only pest control parameters in account endpoints. Our endpoints are environmental protection parameters, and for those, the other effects matter just as well. I'd like, as, as the finish, uh, to, to work you through an example that I picked where some of those predictable ecological effects, non-target effects that you can if you want to pick up, if you do, do it in a right manner, what this could unfold or how this could look. So some of these predictable ecological non-target effects could be secondary pests, could be pest replacements, could be adverse effects on beneficial insects which would affect important predator-prey relationships out there. And I walk you through one case example that has been unfolding, and this is the case example of the Western bean cutworm, a organism that was a herbivore of a crop plant, and only rarely, and in some fringe margins of the production, maize production area in the United States, ever made it to become a target, a target pest, and was called a pest. So it was hanging out there and wasn't doing much. People knew it's there, but it wasn't on our radar as being a serious pest. Now that changed in 2006, 10 years ago, a group of scientists reported that this organism is making its way up on the scale of escalation, and it is doing so largely on and only on transgenic Bt maize. And they were warning that uh, results from the study underscore that we need to look into these kinds of things and investigate also emerging or potential arthropod pests as those that would replace the ones we want to take out with the BT. Now, of course, it was ignored. Greenpeace then started out in 2010 as things evolved and, and developed further and wrote a report where they called that the spread of the Western bean cutworm, which is, was undoubtedly then causing damage, that couldn't be ignored anymore, that was a fact, and was due to pest replacement and hadn't been taken care of or looked into carefully early on. This report of Greenpeace Germany then compelled a number of scientists uh, from corporations and their collaborating partners from universities to look into the matter and come up with a counter uh, report published where they say we maintain that the scientific literature does not provide empirical field collected data that Bt corn is the sole factor of the expansion and the damage that this up and coming pest was inflicting. And they propose that broader ecological and agronomic factors are really to be taken into account and explain the expansion. So it wasn't denied anymore that it's bad, but what it cost was the issue. 
Now I was, and that's why I highlighted it in red, was quite pleasantly surprised because these broad ecological factors and agronomic factors, we had at that point of time already since 15 years calling for and said, if you do risk assessment, you must take those broad ecological factors and agronomic factors into account if you want to do, if you want to avoid that these things happen or to know about it, which are the organisms out there that could make it up on that scale. And I propose that this organism would have made it up on our scale if they had done the risk assessment as we had suggested it to. But here, in this case, these broader ecological and economic factors were used as a means to deflect the responsibility, to deflect the responsibility and say, it's not us, it's the others that caused that expansion. We've got nothing to do with that. It's other reasons and other roles. And those other reasons are these. Change of pesticide and plant protection regime, soil types, cultivation methods like tillage, glyphosate resistant crops in addition to Bt, pest replacement, insect genetics, all the way up to climate change. Well, yes. Exactly, that's what we've been saying needs to be taken into account, but not to accept the deflect responsibility, but to take on that responsibility and gear your risk assessment to doing these kinds of assessments in the first place so that you can pick these organisms out. We have developed such risk assessment concepts, have applied them in numerous case examples by now. We know they work. and. Insects like the bee, western bean cutworm would make it on that radar. We have shown this for a number of other organisms that will make it on the radar if you do the risk assessment right in the first place and do it in broader terms. Now, where are we today? This is a ear, a damaged ear of a BT corn eaten by a western bean a cutworm. Just a few weeks ago, a open letter has been issued by a number of colleagues from field entomologists in the United States who have been recounting and explaining that event with a western bean cutworm where it made its way from being a non-conspicuous, non-target organism that wasn't on the radar at all to become a secondary pest, replacing the one that BT took care of. And now they are urging the industry in this open letter to consider finally that it made its way all the way up now to the primary pest and that they take it on to find solutions for this pest that has been developing on this BT maze. It's not the only other uh, non-target organism that can make it up to a pest uh, status. This is Hemiptera, also predictable. We've been predicting it. We have been also testing it and have found that Hemiptera are not affected by BT. In other production systems, they have been called already being a pest shifting from a minor to becoming a major pest problem. The white fly epidemic right now in India is hitting really bad. Um, the cotton production there, BT cotton production, in addition to the resistance uh, of the target insect, this non-target insect made it out there. As a Homoptera, not affected by the BT. We have a lot of resistance evolution, predictably, coming up now. As the area increased, also did the numbers of resistant organisms standing at seven right now, being the typical culprits and survivors of the selection uh, pressure that is, is being imposed on them. And Consequently, in India, we see today now a significant, this year, a significant drop in production of BT cotton because it's not working anymore. It's not bringing the, the farmers the results they expected. In Portugal, we had a decline over the last years already. In Spain, apparently, according to this uh, newspaper article in this year, they are leaving, abandoning um, transgenic maize by the masses. I'm curious to see the numbers next year uh, coming out of Spain. I hope so. Burkina Faso has been dropping the production of GM cotton due to unintended consequences and is now suing and trying to get compensation out of Monsanto for that. Um, did Europe miss something by not growing in most of the countries the crops? Well, you make up your own mind when it comes to yield and pesticide data, it doesn't look like this. 
These are the yield data over the past, since the 2000, Austria, France, Germany, Netherlands, who's not growing the uh, GM maize. And these are the yield data of the countries, the only one in, in Europe that really grows it at significant levels in Spain. And you see they are right in the average and are fluctuating like everybody else's. We have been doing that. Jack Heinemann had a study on this a number of years ago. We have published these data a number of years ago. Now the New York Times has picked it up and has looked at the data again and has extended it to today to 2017. And this is their conclusion that the yield lines of corn, of maize in Europe and in, in the US has been on par. And the, they call it, that's the title of the New York Times article, <coughs> the promises of genetically modified crops, um, that at least when it comes to yield and to pesticide data, uh, they weren't doing any better than in Europe. So question, is Bacillus thuringiensis still a cornerstone of modern agriculture? Well, you make up your mind. Certainly in these 17 countries, the opinion apparently is no, it isn't, as long as it's these BT plants and herbicide tolerant plants that are out there, we are not missing much and they chose the opt out um, that the EU government, the EU commission has given them now uh, to forego the production of GM crops. Thank you very much, that's my little.